We're going to uh, be in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30 this morning. If you need a Bible, these folks walking down the aisle will give you one. Isaiah chapter 30 as we're going through the book of Isaiah. Just raise your hand, they'll hand you one. <clears throat> Before we uh, stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I have somewhat of an introduction I wanted to uh, kind of set before you. Uh, this morning at 6.30, I, I had an interview uh, with somebody from the Washington Post, and it's no fun to be interviewed at any time by the Washington Post, let alone 6.30 in the morning. I was, I was very tired, and it was Sunday morning, yeah. Um, and they were, they were inquiring uh, in regards to my position on immigration. Uh, you have a number of Christians, and they just had the Baptist gathering, and Russell Moore is the spokesperson for the Baptist convention, and he holds theological positions wholly different than my own, and I, I struggle over uh, his approach to it, especially when he quotes uh, Leviticus 19.34. Uh, it says, but the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And they use these verses along with Mark 12 and Luke 5 and a number of others to say that we're supposed to have open borders and we're supposed to embrace everyone. And there's, you know, this, it is, it is so theologically warped that it, it frustrates me and angers me. And so I, I had put some thoughts together and I'll read those to you momentarily that I shared with them in, in relation to the interview. And it all ties into the message this morning. Uh, but I want to begin with uh, an op-ed that was written in Christianity Today by a megachurch pastor here in California. I'm not gonna read the entirety of it, I'm just gonna read to you what caught my mind, or my eye. It was sent to me by one of the pastors on our staff. And this author says, for over 25 years I've lived and pastored in California. In the last 50 years, uh, this state has experienced as much megachurch success as anywhere else on the earth. We've given birth to the Crystal Cathedral, Calvary Chapel, the Vineyard, TBN, Saddleback Church, and many other megachurch ministries. We haven't just grown a lot of megachurches. We started the megachurch movement, and we have one here in our own, our own town. So if there's anywhere on earth where the overall moral and spiritual climate should be higher now than it was 50 years ago, it should be California, where we have so many successful stories of church growth. Cal, uh, Calvary Chapel alone, 10,000% growth in 51 years, 1,800 churches around the world. But has California become a more church-going place in the last 50 years? A more Christian place? A more moral place? A more godly place? You don't need to live here to know the answer to those questions. They are no, 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 and you aren't seriously asking me that question, are you? <laughs> it's obvious that the culture of our state has been more impacted by Disneyland than by all of our churches combined. And it goes on to share more. And as I reflected on that, I think, what's happened with the church? We've, and, and the growth has been conversion growth, not transfer growth. And yet the moral climate of our state is imploding. We lead the nation in abortions. We're the authors of no-fault divorce and transgender bathroom bills. We, it's, we can go on and on and on. We have the highest gas tax, sales tax, income, the highest debt. All these things are unbiblical principles. And yet here we are. We have AB 2943, a violation of the First Amendment that's going to pass the Senate. It's all going to go forward. We've got SB 54, which does not fall in line with, with uh, biblical immigration policy that you find in, in the book of Ruth or anywhere else in the scriptures. Um, all of these things are being thrust upon us as citizens, and the church is relatively silent. Uh, we just do the gospel, and I've gone through that and shared with you my frustration, but that whole approach is now bringing us to a place where I wanted to share with you some, some thoughts, especially by the American moralist and social critic, Russell Kirk. He lived from 1918 to 1994. He was a very wise man. He wrote, during the past three decades, the influence has grown um, of those Americans who would prefer to stride along without any divinely ordained mission, who believe indeed that um, the American Republic could do famously without being bothered about God. So we want to do politics, we want to do government without God. We want to remove him from the edifices of our buildings and out of our schools and everything else and somehow continue in this constitutional republic as though somehow it's going to survive in the absence of any Christian participation. Humanitarians, where we get this idea of humanism, that is the folks who take for granted that human nature and society may be perfected through means purely human. 
that we're going to obtain this perfection on, in and of our own selves. We don't need God. Man is innately good. We don't have a sin nature. Uh, it's contrary to biblical understanding. Uh, they've come to dominate our universities, our schools, our serious press, most of our newspapers, television, and our radio. Secularism's goal is to lay down the law for this millennium by dominating the spiritual, intellectual, educational, economic, and vocational sphere, uh, spheres of American culture. So there's this picture here, and, and I like what one theologian says. He says, um, well, actually, this was Plato. And Plato said uh, two essential questions come to mind. Who teaches the children, and what do we teach them? Who teaches the children, and what do we teach them? Now, that's going to be decided by who has the influence. Do you understand this? We've arrived at this predicament by distrust of God that lies behind the fleshly and worldly devices now so commonly employed in the churches. God's work is to be done in his appointed way, but instead of that, much of what now pretends to be his work is being done in the world's way. This is the idea of the megachurch and the lack of its influence in the culture. Prayer tears down, uh, prayers and tears are the weapons of heaven. The book of Acts declares that the same tools available to the 12 uh, apostles are offered to today's pastors. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word that you find in the book of Acts. And then Proverbs 11.9 says this, as Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, pointed out, he said, the just shall be delivered through knowledge. And uh, there's a Hebrew scholar who had uh, spoken in relation to this passage. And it's clarified, he says, the proverb does not say that God intervenes to deliver the righteous miraculously, but they are protected by knowledge, da'at in Hebrew, which is to say their wisdom. The proverb assumes that the wise, being the wise, have the mental resources to get themselves out of trouble. So we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, work we need not be ashamed, having a ready answer in season and out of season, and apply that to the culture in which we live, but somehow we think that we separate what we do in this building with what we do in the public square. And thus the church over 50 years has had little effect on the culture in California. Nowhere in the epistles is there a single exhortation for the saints as such to engage in public evangelism, nor even to do personal work and to seek to be soul winners. Rather, um, are they required to witness for Christ by their daily conduct in business and in the home? They are to show forth God's praises rather than tell them forth. They are to let their light so shine before men that it glorify their Father in heaven. The testimony of the life is far more effectual than glib utterances of the lips. Actions speak louder than words. That was Fox. And then again, I love what one pastor says. He says, Christians must be directed by their pastors to bring their faith and values to the public square. We need to get out of the church building into the public square, demonstrating our Christianity as we go about our daily lives. This includes utilizing the gifts of the Spirit, praying for and loving on people, and generally bringing our Christian faith outside the church building. That's been my position. These were some of the words that, that guide and direct what I do. Um, some folks enjoy it, some don't. Uh, I, I've never been moved by that. I'm just supposed to be faithful to the calling that's on my life. So when I got this call this morning, um, it's interesting that, that they're wanting me to make comment in relation to Russell Moore, who is very famous and has articles around the country, and then me, a pastor of a, a church, you know, on a good Sunday, maybe 500 people. I've never written anything. I've never been published with anything, and yet they want my opinion. I thought it interesting that you'd have to really reach deep to the bottom of the barrel to find somebody to comment. Um, you know, Russell Moore's in the book of who's who, I'm in the book of who's he. <laughs> but my comment to the, the um, reporter, and I wanted to share with you, and, and I, I wrote these down, and so I'm going to read them. Uh, the first thing I said is I do not believe the term illegal is dehumanizing in relation to immigration. I do not believe it to be dehumanizing. I recognize the inherent worth of every human being and affirm that all persons who are created in the image of God, regardless uh, of their country of origin or their language they speak, um, you know, we, we give credence and recognition of that. But it's the hypocrisy in this movement that frustrates me, the hypocrisy that I find both on the left and on the right. 
Some rant and rave about illegal immigrants in the country, but don't complain about, <clears throat> but don't complain about the lower prices of freshly picked produce, reduced construction costs, or having cheaper labor for gardening, housekeeping, hotel help, nursing home assistance, and a host of other tasks often performed by illegals at less than appropriate wages. That's hypocrisy. Others demand open borders, uh, strenuously object to extreme vetting, and support the availability of generous government services for all who enter, but they usually have locks on their doors and security systems in their homes and cars, and they strongly object if someone enters their home or uses their possessions without first securing their prior permission, which is also hypocrisy, both on the left and the right. If you want to hear me say, and I told this to the reporter, if you want to hear me say, just open all the borders, anyone who wants to come in for it's the Christian thing to do, you won't hear me say that. And if you want to hear me say, round up the 11 million illegal aliens, throw them out of the country for following the law, uh, is the Christian thing to do, you won't hear me say that either. And in regards to the right or the left, I don't care about the results that work, uh, excuse me, but I do care about results that work and both the Bible and history provide helpful solutions. And if you wanna talk about solutions, I'm willing to have this conversation with you, which she said, yes. I said, our immigration system is broken, Americans know it, polling affirms it, and its problems are obvious. When you have something in your home that is broken, you either fix it or get it fixed, but you don't leave it broken for 30 years. I said, breaking into our country doesn't make you a citizen any more than breaking into my home makes you a member of my family. In 2016 election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, an amazing 70% of registered voters saw the immigration issue as very important to their vote, and those voters uh, chose Trump over Clinton by a margin of two to one, 64 to 32%. The margin was even wider in so-called blue states that uh, Trump unexpectedly won. It was a very hot topic. Many religious critics point to one specific Bible verse as the basis of their opposition to various immigration uh, policies from the president. And they use the verse that I quoted earlier out of Leviticus 19, the King James Version says, but the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. And I told the reporter, I said, it's, all, it's, it's interesting to me that the left is all of a sudden becoming theologically you know, <laughs> wise, and they're standing, and I watched CNN, one man opening the scriptures, reading the scriptures. I'm thinking, can we do this about marriage and abortion? Amen. But no, this is one topic that we want to choose and pick. Russell Moore, National Baptist leader, objected because Baptists have a long history of welcoming the stranger. And th these are quotes that I'd written down in relation to him. <clears throat> and he, he quoted uh, Leviticus 19.34, but the big problem uh, with the use of, of this verse by Russell Moore um, is it doesn't claim to say what he thinks it says. And most pastors in their pulpits don't understand how to defend this, and they should. They need to be prepared to speak in to the public square in relation to the issues that their congregants are facing so that we'll have a ready answer. The meaning of the word stranger, the meaning of the word stranger in Leviticus 19.34, it's a very interesting meaning, and it's one that we need to understand. But before I share with you the meaning of that word, I wanna share with you these commands that are given by God in Mark 12, Luke 5, these others that, you know, uh, love your neighbor as yourself and, and, and all the, the, the verses that folks quote to try to justify open borders. Remember this, that if you want to be a biblical theologian and, and uh, practice exhortation of scripture, then put it into context. The Bible establishes four separate realms of authority, each having its own distinct responsibility. One, the commands some, uh, typically go to the individual, to the Christian individual. Secondly, to the family, as you see in Ephesians, when it says that we're stewards over the lives of our children, not the state. Third, there's a commandment to the church when God speaks to the church. And fourth, there's civil government that God speaks to and commands. So whenever the Bible gives a command, it is important to identify which sphere of command that it is directed towards. And that's one of the things that they love to leave out and use those verses that pertain to the individual and try to make it pertain to the state. Um, are the commands of Jesus directed to the institution of government or are they given to the individual followers of Jesus? You read the passage and you look for its context. And these words are specifically spoken to his individuals in the verses that are quoted by many of these folks and not to the government. So let's return to that verse, Leviticus 19, 34, <clears throat> often used, or I should say often misused, 
uh, by Christians today to defend um, this, this position of immigration. The word stranger, the word stranger is correctly translated a proselyte, that is a convert. Thus the stranger of Leviticus 19 is not just a foreigner who enters the land, but instead is a foreigner who enters with intent of becoming a Jew. Did you understand that? Someone who wants to to fully follow their customs, laws, culture, morality, religious beliefs, practices, and language. They still practice this in Israel. So if you want to take Leviticus 19.34, look at Israel. It's fascinating how you'll proof text the Bible and all of a sudden the thing that you want to kick out of the schools you're now using to defend your position. When a foreign-born citizen finally becomes a Jew, he then gets the same rights and privileges as a native-born Jew, which is the other part of Leviticus 19.34. In the Bible, there are actually three classifications for uh, Israel's inhabitants. And so too in America, they followed the same principles in early immigration policy. One, native-born citizen in Hebrew is called esrach. The foreign-born immigrant who wants to convert to become a Jew is also called a stranger or um, stranger of righteousness, gertzdek. I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that in the Hebrew. And this is what is referred to in Leviticus 19.34. It's this idea of a stranger of righteousness. But the foreigner who comes into the land and lives by its laws but does not want to convert is called a stranger of the gate or a sojourner, gertoshav. So there's three separate understandings. Assimilation was always the objective of our founders and also in the Bible, both in biblical and American immigration. uh, Assimilation assimilation was the whole objective. So any stranger coming to America must be committed to becoming an American in beliefs, habits, and practices. For example, if they come committed to Sharia courts rather than constitutional courts, or to preserve their own separate financial systems or their own educational systems, language, customs, and so forth, then they are not the stranger that God instructed was to be welcomed into the land. This should be very easy for Christian, for Christian to understand. If we want to live in heaven, if we want to become citizens in this new land of heaven, we must fully embrace the standards, values, beliefs, practices that God has established for his kingdom. And we're citizens of heaven, yes? Any notion that Leviticus 19 command to love the stranger translate into mandate for an open border and unrestricted immigration is clearly ridiculous in regards to the, the scriptures. For this reason, Sharia supremacists, ardent socialists, members of gangs or drug cartels, criminals, and so forth are among those who should be excluded. Period. Amen. Amen. Oh, bless you. You're not only an amazing, amazing school administrator, but you know, I'll shut up. <laughs> He's a servant of the Lord. Democrats accuse Republicans. Republicans fault Democrats, but both are to blame. As documented by numerous independent sources, they both have incentives for protecting illegal immigration. Democrats creating a dependent underclass see the potential for easy votes. Republicans often tied to business interests see cheap labor, but there's an abundant evidence that the blame is to be shared in a bipartisan way. Deschatude, deschatude. The main facilitator of illegal immigration is a government that does nothing to change the broken system or enforce the existing laws. And when laws are on the books but not enforced, the law is deshitude. It is regarded as essentially ceasing to exist. Based on the 11 million illegal immigrants, and some say it's higher, some say lower, the immigration situation in America is worse, is the worst it has ever been. So how do we get out of this? And uh, I have a couple of thoughts. Almost finished. A wall must be built. This is not a racist or xenophobic statement. Walls should be built for the same reason Nehemiah built walls in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Bible does God condemn walls, guarding houses, fences, encircling property, or locks protecting doors. They're all for the purpose of security and protection. Okay, we're on the same thing. I like what Reverend Franklin Graham says. He says, um, why do you lock your doors at night? Not because you hate the people on the outside, but because you love the people on the inside so much. The government has every right to utilize a merit-based immigration program, prioritizing those who can contribute most to the nation. 
I'm not proposing amnesty, but rather a rigorous pathway to legalization. I'm not looking for green cards, but maybe amber cards, but you still have to go through the process and you need to become a citizen. You need to learn the constitutional republic ethic. You need to learn language. You need to, all of these things are absolutely necessary. Uh, church and government have different functions, callings and purposes. The role of the government is to protect its citizens and enforce the border. The role of the church is, in simplest terms is to get people to God through Jesus Christ. So I say all this because <clears throat> we struggle as Christians wanting to be compassionate but also law-abiding. What is the purpose of a country? A country is a compact of people who've agreed to a series of laws. And if we're gonna look at it biblically, as you see in the book of Ruth, assimil assimilation is the way to go. You're welcome here. But understand that the, that, that the despotic rulers and the nations you've left to flee here to a nation of freedom, we are who we are because we observe the laws that have made us who we are. You're welcome here, but don't bring with you that which you've left. Come and embrace that which makes us a place of sanctuary. And when I said this, interestingly enough, I can say it in a, a white church, and some of you are going, well, I'm not so sure, Pastor. This is a little uppity. I say this in inner city, or I should say, I say this in a completely Hispanic or Latino church in Northridge, and they all applaud. And most of them are here illegally. <laughs> because they recognize what they left, and they're waiting for someone to articulate it, and the pulpits in America need to start doing their job. And I share all that not, not to divide the body of Christ because the body of Christ is, is the bride. And, and if you say anything about my wife, my bride, you'll be picking up your teeth with your broken arm. I don't, I don't bash the bride of Christ. I want the bride to awaken to its responsibility because for lack of a vision, the people perish. And we have a border representing walls, gates. We have an invasion. An invasion of need, it, it's not a warring factor, although some coming across the border do have that in, intent. But we look at the walls of this, demo, uh, this constitutional republic being threatened. And I share this with you because as we come to Isaiah chapter 30, it's fascinating, this passage of scripture. Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah is saying to Hezekiah, the king, now, now um, uh, 10 of the tribes, I think it is, 10 of the tribes have already been conquered by the Assyrians and taken into captivity. The northern tribes are gone. There's two, two tribes left. And, and they're in Jerusalem and they're surrounded by the Assyrians coming in. These Assyrians are unstoppable. And, and they are ruthless. And you just read history and you see what I speak of. Sennacherib is going to wipe them out. You can't put a lid on the can of Sennacherib. He's, he's, th these warriors are vicious. And so the Israelites are, uh, the, the, the Jews gather and they say, what do we do? And in chapter 30, Isaiah comes out and he says, uh, God's has an answer for you. And he, he gives this prophetic statement to all the citizens. He says, this is what God has to say to you. And they hear the word of God listed and they go, ah, we don't want that. We've yeah. Wait on the Lord. Heard it. Trust in the Lord. Heard that. Pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need something more tangible. So what they do, and you'll see this in Isaiah 30, they go and they take all of the, the wealth in the temple and they go and they purchase assistance from the Egyptians because the Egyptians have swift horses. <laughs> and the Egyptians will be able to defend us from the Assyrians. And so they spend all of their nation's wealth on some sort of a gimmick hoping that it's gonna stave off the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, once they've paid off the Egyptians, the Assyrians go through the Egyptians like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> and then Hezekiah is surrounded by the Assyrians and everyone's starving. And there's 187,000 Assyrians surrounding Jerusalem. And it's at that moment that God comes and speaks to them. He doesn't go, you stupid idiots. I warned you, you know what? I am so tired of you, I'm gonna squish you like a bug. No, he doesn't do that. And you know, church, we're just like the Jews. How long is it gonna take us to realize that the solution isn't gonna be in all your finagling and all your partisan ways? How long is it gonna be that you're gonna call out to the Lord and ask for his direction? Where's the church when it comes to prayer? 
When are we going to be desperate enough? And one of the things that I said to this reporter is I said, you know what's fascinating? If we call the pastors in my community to gather for SB 54 or AB 2943, we'll, we'll get a couple, a couple. But when we go into the inner city, where there's Latinos and Hispanics and there's blacks and there's Asians, and we call for this gathering, it is heavily attended. And they're mostly Democrats and multiple illegals. And they're waiting for an answer and they're rejoicing in an understanding of a constitutional republic where their vote actually counts. And they're thinking to themselves, this is possible? They're stunned, and yet the white church on the hill is so apathetic. And in the scripture, it says that at the voice of one, a thousand will flee. Do you realize that the secular progressive left that dominates everything in social media, and the minute you get on there and state your Christian positions, they just berate you and ridicule you, and you just kind of cower into the corner and quiet. At the voice of one, a thousand will flee. The governor of the state of California was elected by 9 million votes. There's over 30 million Christians in California. Hello? So if my people were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and the Lord will hear from heaven and heal their land. But it's time we wake up and we start to realize, and I know, I know the bottom line Everybody just wants to be left alone. Wouldn't you just like that? Just leave me alone and let me raise my family. But they keep pushing in. And at this point, it's like they're at the gate. Now what do we do? Amen. Let's go get the Egyptians and some swift horses. <laughs> we need to organize and strategize. And, well, we're going to find a really wonderful insight in Isaiah 30. And I pray this passage encourages you, blesses you, and equips you. So let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We're going to pick up at verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. For his princes were at Zo Zoan and his ambassadors came to Haines, the underwear developing area. <laughs> and they were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them or be helped or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden against the beasts of the south through a land of trouble and anguish from which came the lioness and the lion, the viper, the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, I have called her Rahab Hem Shabeth, which means Rahab sits idle. <laughs> Rahab's worthless. Now go write it before them on a tablet and noted on a scroll that it may be for a time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Therefore, thus says the Lord, uh, excuse me, thus Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you a breach in your wall, ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant, and he shall break it like the breaking of the potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces, he shall not spare. So there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the her, uh, hearth, or to take water from the cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, and pay attention to this, in returning and rest, please listen, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses, swift horses. Therefore you shall flee. 
and we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left as a pole on top of a mountain, as a banner on a hill. Therefore, the Lord will wait. Listen to this. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem and you shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Let's pray. Lord, would you encourage us this morning as we face so many travails and trials and difficulties in our nation, here in this state, we see all these difficulties around the world, and Lord, we're perplexed, we're confused over those who declare the word of the Lord, yet their understanding of scripture is so convoluted. God, would you please speak to us and give us clarity? Would you equip us to remain strong and to wait upon you and to trust you and not to run after swift horses or foreign governments that will be our salvation, but we'll look to you. And so God, thank you. Would you bless us now and lead us into all truth, Holy Spirit? We invite you to minister to us and we thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, please have a seat. I, um, before I get into the passage, I wanted to share that uh, yesterday I had the privilege to um, officiate a, a memorial service of somebody I didn't know. I got this request on Thursday or Friday. It was a sheet of paper, very little information on it. Um, the, the name of the congregant who attended here was somewhat familiar to me, but I couldn't put a, a face to the name. Uh, the deceased, I had no idea of. The the the, the girlfriend of the deceased, I, I didn't know. And it was in Simi Valley, and I, you know, I was looking forward to a Saturday without anything to do, and the service was on Saturday, and you know, I was gonna give it to Brett, or give it to Tony, or give it to John, or give it to one of the pastors on staff, and take my Saturday off, and, and, uh, and the Lord just told me no. And I'm, I'm thinking, why, why, why no? And he said, you, you need to do this. And, and as I pondered it, I, I said, okay. And I was still perplexed by it. I didn't have any of, enough information. And I'm driving to see me. And it's, I'm going to be stepping into a room. I don't know anybody. I'm going to be officiating a memorial service. It, it, trust me, it's just a strange situation. And um, Pastor Tony called me. said, you all prepare. I said, with whatever I have, I'm going to do the best I can. And I was troubled by it all day. And I, I was praying. And God gave me a word going over there. I walk in, the first person I meet is the deceased daughter, precious young lady, her name was Jennifer. She walks me through and immediately I realized God's hand is on this. And when I met the girlfriend and then I met the congregant who was friends with this lady, um, the congregant, this woman, uh, the congregant had shared with me about her story, uh, the girlfriend of the deceased, and said she'd had brain surgery. I said, oh, really? And then I came to find out uh, from the girlfriend that it wasn't just brain surgery, um, her ex-husband who was in prison had put a hit on her and two men had come and beaten her to death and left her for dead. And uh, she had brain surgery as a result of the beating and couldn't walk. And here was a woman that was standing before me and she'd actually met this man, Ian Campbell, who passed away on the dance floor at the Cowboy Palace in Simi Valley. Uh, and they were dancing together. She spoke about the grace of God and how wonderful and what God had done and the positive outlook. And she was surrounded by folks and they'd created a community of people who had gone through all kinds of tough situations in life, and I realized this is a remarkable community that doesn't consider itself a church, but asked a pastor and invited him to come in and speak words of hope and encouragement and love, and it ended up being one of the most precious events and strengthened my heart, and I had the privilege to meet Cassie is her name. What a precious, precious lady, and she said, when are your services? And I said, 9 and 11. She said, I'll be there tomorrow. And um, I, I just can't wait to get to know her in a better way, and I, I met um, Ian Campbell was a man who passed. I met uh, his two children, Jennifer and Christian. Uh, Ian's son, Christian, had been in a motorcycle accident. He was in a wheelchair. Precious man, spoke highly of his father. I thought, what a wonderful Father's Day blessing to hear his son, who most people would give up on life, and he had such a positive outlook. And it was a remarkable gathering. And I say that because God's word in his presence comforts every room. Regardless of whether they're churchgoers or not, God's word doesn't return void. And as a minister, 
watching folks that had no clue who I was, watching as his word was going forward, just, just the words leaving my mouth, entering into their ears, touching their heart, and seeing a room or a gathering of people deeply touched. I share that because as we go to this passage of scripture, we may be troubled in a myriad of ways, and, and this passage doesn't necessarily have to uh, relate to immigration. That's not my point in reading everything I did, but I, I want us to, to look at verse 18 because this is what I want you to, to glean for yourself. And I believe this is God's word to you specifically. And hear the word of the Lord, verse 18. The Lord will wait, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Do you understand that? He wants to be gracious to you. Therefore, He will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are those who wait for him. You see, as his children, we go through life and we face challenges and difficulties. As the family in Simi had faced with the death of a loved one, as many of you are probably facing financial, health, relational, I can go through a myriad of pictures. You got something that's hitting you. And our first inclination that when we are faced with a trial is we pick up the phone and call somebody who has resources, don't we? We, we pick up the phone and call somebody else who can give us counsel. We pick up the phone and call somebody who will lament with us, who will comfort us. The, 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 really, the last thing we typically do, and, and, and if you don't believe me, I'm a pastor of over 20 years, and I've heard it so many times. This is my favorite line, and it irritates me to no end. All I can do now, pastor, is pray. Why do you go to the church if you don't listen? All I can do now is pray? That's the first thing you should be doing. And the reason why we state that is because really, religion is perfunctory. It's something we do because we just do it. And the concept of prayer, oh, that's kind of quaint. I'll just throw one up to the big guy in the sky. I'll let you know if I need you. But you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. I'll let you know when I need you. That's not a relationship with the living God who keeps your heart beating and your lungs moving. That's not the God who holds you and grounds you and, and blesses you and causes the, the sun to rise and the sun to set and the rains to fall and, and to fall gently upon your field and to provide you food upon. The, the, the seasons that come in order, the God who holds the heavens in the span of, of his hand. And, and all I can do now is pray. How tragic of a statement. How sad. We will go after everything. Swift horses from Egypt will run after any opportunity other than call upon God. We'll figure out a political solution. We will mobilize. How often do these meetings begin in prayer? I asked that question. It used to be that every public gathering in our nation would begin with prayer. And it began with the Constitutional Convention with Benjamin Franklin when they were divided over large states and small states. They couldn't come to a a consistent understanding. And the Constitutional Convention was over. uh, Mason was leaving. Washington chases after him, says, come back. They finally gather in the room. They can't figure out what to do as far as equal representation. Some wanted it by population. Some wanted equal representation by size. Some states had more population. Others had smaller. They're trying to get 13 of these folks together. And Benjamin Franklin stands in the midst of the Constitutional Convention. He said, early on in this contest, we called upon God in every moment. And he delivered us. Have we forgotten so great a friend? A sparrow doesn't fall from the sky without his full knowledge. He says, I I call us to take three days of fasting and prayer. Come back and reconvene. And it was after those three days of fasting and prayer, they came back and they came up with a, a remarkable picture of a bicameral legislature, upper house and lower house, two senators for every state. And the lower house was done by representation of population. Unprecedented. Fascinating held together by prayer and treating the God of the universe for understanding. But we can figure this out without God. All we need to do is just be louder and angrier. All we need to do is is organize. All we need to do is do to them what they're doing to us. We just need to take their, 
their ideas and just apply them to our ideas. Their strategies will work with our ideas. But where's the prayer? Where's the beseeching of God? We, we do that corporately and individually. We come up with every other idea other than asking God. Prayer is so foreign to us and so distant from us. And yet, I love this about the passage that, that I really believe God wanted for you today. I, I want to show you the predicament that they're facing. They sold everything they had and, and asked the Egyptians to come and save them because the Egyptians had swift horses. And, and as the passage said, God said, they, yeah, the Egyptians have swift horses, but the Assyrians have swifter horses. So what's your solution? And after, after they had spent everything, the Assyrians went through the Egyptians, like I said, a hot knife through butter, and then the Assyrians were at the gate. And you know what? In, in verse 18, fascinating to me, in verse 18, the Lord said this, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait. I love this. My daughter came to me and I've shared with you the story about Natasha and she said, dad, I have to do this experiential. I can't live in this house. I don't understand your love of God. I don't get the whole deal. She, we adopted her from Russia when she was 12. By 17, she'd had enough. She didn't want to be part of our family. She loved us, but she just didn't understand the God thing. And she said, I have to do this and I got to go find my way and I know the answer's out there and I got to go find the swift horses and I got to go find the Egyptians and I got to find out uh, solutions to my problems other than God. And I remember the parting words I shared with her on that rainy night, uh, the very first time it rained, and, and she's packed her jalopy full of junk. And I said, and she's getting ready to drive down to Oxnard. And I, you heard the joke. I said, you know, honey, people spend their whole life trying to get out of Oxnard. You're moving into it. <laughs> no offense, George. Um, and, and as I said that to her, as I said that to her, she said, Dad, I just have to do this. I said, I understand. I said, I'll wait. But I did say this to her. I said, honey, if you find anything better than Jesus out there, you got to come tell me. Because you're going to see if there's swift horses and Egyptians that can help you. And the only one that can help you is the Lord. If you find anything better than the Lord out there, come tell me. Doggone it, she gave it a good try. A year and a half. She was living in a cesspool. Life was a living hell. Micah was the one who went and moved her and said, uh, you know, Rob, where she was living was just, I, w I, wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't put a stray dog in that room. And you know what? One of the things the Lord told me when I walked into the house after she drove away and the, friend, uh, the family was cooking some Adele's chicken and apple sausage and, and it smelled so good. It was cut up and it was browning in the pan and I took a bite of it because food's a comfort. I took a bite of it and I said, that's so good. And the person said, and I'll never forget, he said, you know, it's really good, but you don't want to know how it's made. And it reminds me of when I went to the Dodger game uh, with John Lindsay and we went to the Dodger game and we were in a suite and, and uh, the guy who was running the suite, um, you know, you had the Dodger dogs out there and I'm getting a Dodger dog and putting all the condiments on it. He goes, you know, I used to work for Farmer John's. <laughs> I said, really? He goes, yeah, the, the, the old line at Farmer John's was the only part of the pig we didn't use was a squeal. <laughs> As I'm taking a bite of the Dodger dog. <laughs> really? Well, but I have to say, I love Dodger dogs. I love the finished product. I don't know what they're using, but it's tasty. <laughs> and in the same regard to Adele's chicken and, and apple sausage, I, I, you know, they say, you don't want to know how it's made, but I have to say, I love the finished product. And at that point, God spoke to my heart and he said, Rob, you don't want to know what's going to happen in her life. Turn off social media. But when I'm finished with her, you're going to love the finished product. His comment to me was, just wait. So let me take you back to verse 18. Therefore, with all these challenges, therefore, with all this fright, therefore, with the Assyrians at the gate, therefore, with the Egyptians being annihilated, therefore, with you rebelling, therefore, with you not seeking my counsel, therefore, with you doing everything that you think you can do apart from God, having failed... What God's saying is, you go ahead and get your swift horses. You go ahead and get your Egyptians. You go ahead and move to Oxnard. You go ahead and do your own deal. I'll wait. I'll wait. 
And you know how he waits? The same way I did for my little girl. His heart's breaking. He hates to see you struggle. There's an parent in the room who longs to see their child going through trial. I waited, but doggone it, I prayed. And I waited with hope, and the Lord waits with hope. Sometimes you just gotta keep hitting your head on that brick wall, but I'll wait. You wanna do it your way, you do it your way, but I'll wait. I hate seeing you hurt yourself, but I'll wait. Because it doesn't matter what I say, you won't listen. You're gonna have to figure this one out, I'll wait. But my heart's breaking, but I'll wait for you. You run after every little thing you think's gonna fix the problem, I'll wait. And I'll always be here. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, and I'll love you forever. And the Lord says, therefore, you go ahead and do all that, but I will wait. And I wanna tell you why I'm gonna wait. Because I wanna be gracious to you. You see, they surrounded the walls. And when it finally got to this place, where it was so overwhelming, so frightening, they realized there's no Egyptians left. These walls aren't gonna hold for long. We're running out of food. All I can do now is pray. God's in the business of waiting for you to come to that place. That's where you should have begun all along, Rob. Amen. You know, I didn't envy what Natasha went through, and she grew a lot, but I'll tell you who grew the most was me. A lot of sleepless nights. Michelle, too. We learned what it was like to wait upon God. We learned what it was like to trust him. For weeks, we didn't know where she was or she was alive. We knew what it was like to hold every thought captive to the mind of Christ when the enemy would frighten you and say, oh, the, more, the, the coroner's gonna call and you're gonna have to come pick up your daughter, her body. The Lord just said, trust me, wait. Interestingly enough, at this place in time, after Isaiah 30, you find it in conjunction with Kings 18, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib, at the bottom here, Assyria marched against all the fortified towns of Judah and seized them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lashish. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I shall bear whatever you impose on me. So the king of Assyria imposed upon the king Hezekiah of Judah a payment, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. He didn't have it. He didn't have it. And here he was, overwhelmed, frightened, and absolutely paralyzed. Would you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 19? It comes after 2 Kings 18. Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 is faced with 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, of which he doesn't possess. His personal resources are finished. He doesn't have any more options. What do we do then? All we can do now is pray. Apparently nobody was listening to the message. Let's try it again. <laughs> having exhausted all of our personal resources, having nowhere else to go, no swift horses, no Egyptians to call on, no silver, no gold, all we can do now is pray. Look at verse 15. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the king, kings of Assyria have laid waste to the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Stop for a minute, and if you would sh look with me, let's go back to verse 18 of Isaiah 30. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted. Do you notice that he's being exalted in Hezekiah's prayer? Do you see that? 
Hezekiah's prayer, fascinatingly enough, is exalting the Lord. You're between, you're between the cherubim, that all the world will know that you're God. All the, all the idols, the gods with a small G have been thrown in the fire. Lord, let Sennacherib and, and all the Assyrians know who you are. Please, God, I have not sought you, but now I cry out to you. And God says, I'm waiting for you that I might be gracious to you. This prophecy had been given to, to Hezekiah. He now understands it. You mean, God, you're not going to tell me I told you so? When Natasha came home, I didn't look at her and go, where the heck have you been? You pathetic human being. Don't think for a minute you're going to come back into this house after all of the misery you have caused upon your family. Don't you think you're going to sleep in a bed after you have soiled everything that our good name of our family has, has entrusted our, our lives to? You've made a mockery of everything. There's no way you're coming. No, are you kidding me? I couldn't wait. I, that, I, when she hung up and she said, Daddy, I want to come home. I couldn't wait. I was out waiting for her. It was like the prodigal son. I would have run had it not been Oxnard and me being this fat. <laughs> God wants to be gracious to you. Look, we've all got it wrong. We've tried everything but the Lord. Can't we all agree how stupid that is? Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. You go ahead and try all your political shenanigans. It just, just take what the left's doing and apply it to the right. But would you open your meetings in prayer? Just do what everyone else does. Finance your house with borrowed money, even though the Bible says the borrower is a slave to the lender. Have you thought about prayer? Have you thought about waiting on him for provision? Have you asked him if this is something he wants for your family? Someone came to me and said, well, we're moving. I said, why are you moving? Oh, we're moving because we can buy a house and such and such. I hear that all the time. I don't see that anywhere in scripture, honestly. Not, not to condemn those who make the decision and God will work it together for good. But I think about that. And I think that's going to be a tough move. God usually calls you out because he's calling you to something. And, and it's not a house to buy. It's a ministry. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Yes, he is. But he blesses those who wait on him. You see, Hezekiah prayed. The Assyrians were about to annihilate them, 187,000. And as he prays, you know what happens? That night, I'll read this to you. This is uh, 2 Kings 19. It goes on to say, and it came to pass, verse 35, on a certain night that an angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000. When the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of the Assyrian, departed and went away and returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nirosh, his god, that his sons Adramamalek and Sherarez struck him down with the sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eshadaradan and his son reigned in his, in his place. One angel wiped out 187,000 Assyrians. 185,000. <laughs> We see that, and we go, that's a really cool scripture. But we are just like Jonah. God says, do this, we go, no, I'm not doing that. that. That requires waiting. I don't wait. God says, I'll teach you how to wait. <laughs> scripture says he was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. He didn't see the sunrise and the sunset. How does he know three days and three nights? And he, the fish goes down, you know, he falls to the front of the fish, the fish swims up, he swims to the back of the fish, you know, 100% humidity, 98.6 degree temperature, he's got stomach acid, he's just probably stuck in this thing, just trying to get some air. If I was in that belly for, for three seconds, I'd be going, God, I, I quit, time, I tap, I'm tapping, I'm tapping, I'm out. Jonah is as stubborn as stubborn can be. Three days, he finally cries out to God and says, I'm sorry, forgive me. And 
And sure enough, he's vomited up on the beach of the place God had called him to originally go. And he goes, I get the idea. And he's partially digested. Let me go tell him what you wanted me to say. Do you want this? This is the equivalent of Oxnard. <laughs> All right, let's go to something easier. Prodigal son. We know the story of the prodigal. When he had spent all of his father's inheritance, it's interesting, God says, I'll wait. And you know what God does while we're waiting, as it says in Isaiah 30, verse 18? You know what he does while we're waiting? He divinely moves circumstances to bring you to the end of your resources. Because he knows that you are only gonna be happy in his presence and with his counsel. And when this young son takes all of his father's inheritance and does it on, you know, spends it on alcohol and prostitutes and, and illicit drugs and on and on and on, he finally is living, he's lost all of his friends because he has no more money. Uh, he's not the life of the party anymore. It's taken its toll on him. He's living in a pig farm, eating pods, and he realizes it would be far better to be a servant for my father than to be here. And I'm gonna go back and, and beg. But what brought him to the end of himself was Luke 15, verse 14 says, but when the prodigal had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. God will dry up the resources. And you're going, what, what, what kind of a God are you? A God who's waiting for you. Yeah, but I, did, I, I don't, I had a plan. And you, you, I'm gonna try something else. I don't need you right now. But the passage says in verse 17, when he came to himself, finally came to his right mind. You know what? I'm living on his dirt, breathing his air, drinking his water. I'm gonna be living life by his rules. I'm gonna ask him to order my steps. We come up with every finagling plan think ourselves so wise to devise, and we never stop to seek the God of the universe to illuminate our minds. You think that the founder of our country understood the power of prayer his people would? God's people would understand? Benjamin Franklin understands prayer, and many people say, oh, he was, he was a deist. Just, just kind of take a look at where he was buried and read his tombstone of a worn out book a man who cried and called upon God and commanded those who led the nation to do as such, but we will do anything but that. This man came to himself. Benjamin Franklin came to himself. And the prodigal son ran home. And you know what? His dad wasn't judgmental, he was gracious. He saw him coming, he could tell from a distance by the gate of his son's walk. He began to run. If you don't know the power of that, I sure do. I know what it's like to have that tear hugging my girl. I had nothing but grace and mercy for her. This is Psalm 34, verse 7. But before I share that with you, I want to close with this. King David understood what it was like to wait upon God, that he would be gracious. David tried to do everything in his power to stave off the conflicts in the palace as a king to the point where he had Uzziah murdered, or Uriah the Hittite murdered, excuse me, Uriah the Hittite murdered. He tried to cover it up. Nathan confronted him. He could have killed Nathan, but he finally came to a place where he repented. He wrote this song, which is called a psalm, Psalm 32, he says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. The Bible says that the way of the transgress transgressor is, is painful. And, and we, we endure so much not to seek his counsel. And David is, is trying to manipulate and, and, and play whack-a-mole with every conspiracy to try to somehow hide his sin, even though it's been before God all the time. He's not concerned with that. He's more concerned with how they find him politically. 
and his bones are groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. The Assyrians surrounded me. The swift horses were destroyed. The Egyptians were wiped out. God, I have nothing left. And at that moment, David says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. When Natasha came back, she said, Daddy, I'm sorry. That's all I need to hear. I didn't need to go through the whole list. Daddy, I'm sorry. Will you and mommy forget? Yes. <laughs> I forgave you before you ever asked. Of course. I'm just happy you're home. That's how God is with all of us. Are you tired yet? You still got a plan outside of what God wants for your life? He's waiting. And like David, when you finally come to the end of yourself and your resources are all dried up, all you need to acknowledge is your sin before God. Lord, I tried everything but you. And you know what God does? At the end of verse five, it says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. He's gracious. He's merciful. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near me. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. And then David went on to write this. I sought the Lord. He waited for me. I finally came to the end of myself. And at that point, I sought him and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. And they looked to him who were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. And this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And then David said this, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. You know, I love in the passage of scripture where the Bible speaks of guardian angels that we don't just have one, we have a, a few of them. I think I've got a, a ton of them. They're all tired. <laughs> but you think one angel wiped out 185,000 Assyrians and each of us has assigned one, maybe more. And all God wants to do is have you trust him and wait upon him. Oh, I don't like to wait. Okay. If you won't wait on him, he'll wait on you. Have a nice time. Enjoy the belly. And when you're partially digested and miserable and your bones are growing old and you've made a mess of everything, you just come back and tell him, I'm sorry. And he'll be gracious and merciful to you. And then that angel that's encamped around you will take care of it. And then you'll know who's God. But if you want to go get the Egyptians and go buy some swift horses, good luck with that. Especially if you have a desire to save your city, your county, your state, your nation, or the world, let alone your family. You want to do it apart from him? And you got some sort of idea other than prayer and his word and waiting on him instead of him waiting on you to come to a place of waiting on him. You know why he has us wait on him? Because he's never late. But he's never early either. And when you think he's late, he's not. You're just anxious. And he's teaching you faith. And Rob, yes, Lord, your little girl's going to come home. And Rob, yes, Lord, I'll take care of the memorial service. You don't have to be anxious. You'll step in there, and I'm going to show you things that will blow your mind. And if you can trust me with the memorial service, and you can trust me with your daughter, you can trust me with anything. And that is called growing in faith. You can have your superficial faith where you put God in a compartment, and you play games and think yourself a faithful Christian where your life is filled with anxiety and worry and sleeplessness, where you're finagling and trying to come up with some solution. And God says, I'll wait. But I'll tell you the better portion. Let's wait on him. You know how you wait on him? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. 
God will keep the imperfect peace whose mind is steadfast on thee. Calm and quiet your soul like a weaned child and rest in him instead of worrying. Worrying is running after the Egyptians. God wants you to wait on him and realize that angel, all he has to do is snap his finger and your problem's done. God's allowing this to cause you to wait. Wait. And if you don't want to wait on him, he'll wait on you. But that's the harder portion. We're Christians. It's time for all of us to wait on him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the, the picture of a king who is so overwhelmed and so distraught, but yet in the midst of just being paralyzed with fear and having run out of resources, he returns to the verse that you had given him long before the problem had ever occurred, that the Lord will wait that he might be gracious to you. Therefore, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, but blessed are those who wait for him. Lord, we want to be blessed. We want to be blessed. And so, Spirit of the living God, would you give everyone in this room and at the hearing of my voice the ability to wait upon you, that they would be patient, long-suffering, anxious in nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, they would just lay their cares at your feet, and in doing so, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. Though 185,000 Assyrians surround the gate, one angel that stands to protect your child will speak, and that enemy will be vanquished. God, as the Assyrians cut through the Egyptians like a hot knife through butter, one angel wiped them out with the speaking of a word. And so, Lord, we serve a mighty God, a God that is worthy of, of our patience to wait upon you and to trust you. So make us a, a body of believers that wait upon you and seek you and trust you and pray to you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and we'll close with a song of praise.